welcome to the Adelaide Biomed City Mini Review webinar series. My name is Andrew Zanatino and I'll be your chair this afternoon. Uh, before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to acknowledge that the, we're meeting on Ghana land uh, and uh, we acknowledge the Ghana people as the original custodians on the land in which we meet. Um, I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to remind you uh, that uh, you can ask questions in these sessions and uh, there's a little Q&A button on the bottom of the screen. Uh, please feel free to click on that and ask a question of our speakers and uh, that'll give me a chance to relay those questions at the end of their presentations. Um, this afternoon, we have two speakers, uh, Professor Robert, or as we will call him, Bob, uh, Bob Casson, uh, and Dr. Michelle Sun. Um, so I'm going to move to our first speaker, who is uh, Professor Bob Casson. Uh, Bob is a head of uh, discipline of ophthalmology and visual sciences at the University of Adelaide. Um, he is an ophthalmic clinician scientist uh, with special interests in glaucoma, neuroprotection, retinal laser interactions, ophthalmic epidemiology, and translational ophthalmic research. He is a vice chair and chief scientific advisor to the evidence-based non-government organization called Sight for All. This is a not-for-profit organization that uh, was started almost 15 years ago by himself, um, another well-known South Australian and Australian of the Year for 2019, Dr. James Mukey and Henry Newland, um, who have been volunteering uh, on saving site projects throughout Asia. <clears throat> And he's by working with his foreign colleagues uh, and he's been able to identify areas of need and provided subspecialty education and equipping eye clinics uh, throughout these areas and saving the sight of many people who are in disadvantaged circumstances. Uh, overwhelmingly, Bob is a, a true clinician scientist and, and he's been able to foster a number of really critical interdisciplinary uh, groups and uh, derive a number of solutions to a number of eye-related problems. It gives me a great pleasure to, to welcome Bob and uh, to present his title of his talk is the Low-Level Laser Therapy for Retinal Disease. Uh, so welcome, Bob. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, thanks for inviting me to speak in this webinar series. It's a great uh, pleasure to be uh, with everybody in cyberspace. So uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, briefly show you some uh, results from a very exciting new laser technology that uh, we've been utilising to treat um, some retinal diseases and been studying in the lab. A uh, relevant uh, financial disclosure here is that I'm a named inventor on a pending patent where Alex Medical is the assignee. So just by way of uh, background, our university department, the Discipline of Ophthalmology and Visual Science, collaborates extensively with the clinical department at the, uh, in the Royal Adelaide Hospital, the ophthalmology department, and we provide research support to the non-government organisation Site for All. And we collaborate extensively with our colleagues, investigators nationally and internationally, and also with industry, and increasingly actually with industry and a greater and greater proportion of our funding, as it turns out, comes from industry these days. I'd just also like to put into uh, your minds there the idea of the eye as a multi-dimensional research tool. So the eye, of course, lends itself beautifully to technology uh, involving light and lasers and photonics. Uh, imaging is intensive in ophthalmology, so it lends itself nicely to machine learning. And it is, of course, the window to the brain. The retina is a part of the brain and it can be utilised to study neurodegenerative diseases and also cardiovascular disease. And my own group is particularly interested in energy metabolism, as it turns out photoreceptor metabolism is very similar to that of cancer. So there's a lot going on in the eye that uh, is relevant to a wide ranging interdisciplinary research. So just a little bit of a refresher of what, what the eye does. So the eye really is a marvel of, of nature. Light from the distance is focused by the refractive elements of the eye, the cornea, and the lens onto the back of the eye, so the retina, the light sensitive film, where it's captured by the photoreceptors and converted to electrical signals and transmitted along the optic nerve to the brain. So that's all fine when it's, when it's working. In a little more detail here, light activates the photoreceptors, which is then transmit to the second order neurons in the bipolar cells, and then to the retinal ganglion cells, the axons of which comprise the optic nerve. 
So we've been interested in this technology, low energy light therapy, so-called photo photobiomodulation, that has been around for a number of decades now. And there's frankly quite a lot of mysticism and a bit of nonsense around this in the literature. And we came at this very skeptically at first, but were quite surprised by the results we saw in terms of its neuroprotective uh, effect on neuronal cells, and retinal neurons in the, in the lab. The thought is that this light at a 670 nanometer acts really at a quantum level by uh, increasing the activity of a copper atom in the electron transport chain in the very final step of the reduction of oxygen to water. And it increases, uh, enhances ATP production, it acts as an antioxidant and also has anti-inflammatory properties. There are a number of uh, ophthalmic diseases which we could target with this and we selected initially to target diabetic retinopathy and later retinitis pigmentosa and more recently age-related macular degeneration. In diabetic retinopathy, the retina vessels become uh, ischemic or leaky and there is quite frequently swelling at the macula, so macular edema, which is the major cause of visual impairment in diabetic retinopathy. And that is currently treated with intravitreal uh, injections of anti-VEGF. So it would be great to have an, an alternative or an adjunctive therapy. We utilize optical coherence tomography a lot in ophthalmology. Here's an example of it. Here's the sort of images you obtain, which are near sort of histological resolution. This is swelling of the macula, edema at the macula. A colleague in Sydney uh, had a prototype of this laser, as, as did we, Mark Gillies, is a friend and colleague. And we started collaborating in this project a few years ago now. Mark's team showed that the laser in the lab reduced leakage from vessels in a model of leaky retinal blood vessels in mice. And then we then fairly rapidly took it to a human study because it is really quite safe, demonstrating that this laser did in fact reduce macular edema over time. It was a small study, not controlled, but it needs uh, and certainly motivates further research in the DR field. We then took it to retinitis pigmentosa, which currently has no treatment. It's a fairly common blinding disease in the working age population, where generally the rods suffer first. They are responsible for night vision, uh, but eventually the cones at the center of the macula die uh, from secondary de degeneration. And we trialed this laser as a method to rescue cones. This young lady, uh, as an example, receiving the laser, this, that's the setup of it, a slit lamp delivered laser for 90 seconds. She has very advanced uh, RP and is severely visually impaired. So essentially in a nutshell, we found quite marked protection in vivo, of, in vitro of photoreceptors, and then uh, in vivo in an animal model, the RD1 mouse model, which is an aggressive model of RP. And then took this to a small clinical trial, a small phase one slash two, demonstrating that it was safe and that there was in fact recovery of five letters of vision, which is quite a substantial improvement, which petered out over time. So that was all exciting. The next phase of this research, all of this continues in parallel, but we are uh, targeting next age-related macular degeneration. We've had some exciting results in vitro, in, in the lab already uh, in vitro with this. Um, and we'll be taking this to a human study in the near future as potential adjunctive treatment. Thanks very much for your attention. Thanks, Bob. Um, fantastic presentation. And um, this is um, uh, really fascinating that you can actually use lasers to, to, to do this, to actually you know, change the, the, essentially the, the biology of the cells that make up the eye. I'm, I'm just curious though, the idea of shi shining a, a laser into the, into the back of the eye, it's not something that I would uh, see as being, you know, something I'd jump to in, in, in an instant, I have to say. Um, is there any real danger of using this this low energy lasers to to actually um, address these conditions like um, the retinitis, retinitis pigmentosa? Yeah, so I mean, we, we use lasers routinely in ophthalmology, of course, and retinal lasers are really you know quite ubiquitous. But th they all have varying energy profiles and safety profiles. So some lasers will be used deliberately to burn, essentially burn tissue in the retina. But this this laser is basically a deep red light laser at uh, 670 nanometers at very low energy levels. And our safety studies in, in animals uh, indicate that really you have to sit the animal at this light for a very long time to cause any, any sort of injury. 
and really with huge energy doses, much more than we would ever deliver clinically. So it certainly seems extremely safe. You could view this laser as really similar to looking, basically staring at a red light for 90 seconds, basically, right. Andrew. Okay. Just as a follow-up, I mean, clearly, you, it, just based on the data that you, we saw on the screen, it appeared to be a, um, a sort of a, a, a period where it start, the actual effects of it would, would did, uh, reduce. Yes. Um, how often can you apply this type of laser to the back of the eye? I mean, can, yeah. is it, can something that I can go in and get repeated dosing that's effectively? A, that's a great question. So we don't, we don't know that. So, you know, if, if we get a development grant, Andrew, we'll know some answers to this, uh, this question. But um, in that trial, that the, the graph I showed of the petering out data in the RP patients, they received two treatments a week just for four weeks. Um, so... It looks like the effect peters out. Um, how often you can deliver it, we don't know. The optimal t uh, frequency for delivering, we don't know. So there's, there's still a lot to, lot to, lot to learn. Yeah, um, and just one final thing. I mean, this is something obviously that, that is, is going to have a major impact in people, like you say, with a relatively common uh, um, ocular d d uh, pathology. Um, uh, is this something that's been done globally? Is this something that's been done worldwide? So there's been increased interest in this technology over the last sort of few years, I, I would say. And some groups have developed LED, um, so light emitting diode type systems to apply this light to the retina. But uh, it's really an extremely uncontrolled uh, approach because the, there's really no way of knowing the dose, as it were, the irradiance that reaches the, the, the retina. Um, so the, the, the one particular uh, attractive feature of the slit lamp technology is that the exact um, dose of light um, can be delivered to, an, to a specific area. So you know exactly where you're treating and, and with what energy level that you're treating. So that's, that, that, that's a major advantage of this technology compared to, compared to other systems. But it is, but it is becoming of, of interest to others, that's right. Bob, thanks very much for your presentation this afternoon. It was really fabulous. Really appreciate your time. That's a pleasure. Terrific. Um, our second speaker this afternoon is uh, Dr. Michelle Sun, or Sun, sorry. Um, Dr. Sun is an early career ophthalmic surgeon scientist, an incoming glaucoma fellow at Stanford University Department of Ophthalmology. And it's a heck of an achievement to get that Guernsey, and I'm hoping that uh, when uh, COVID is no more an issue, that that will be something that she can uh, fulfill. Uh, she also she completed a PhD in 2017, which investigated new applications of bioengineering with ophthalmology. And uh, she's published over 50 publications and has an attracted over a million dollars in competitive uh, scholarships and grant support, including a highly competitive National Health Medical Research Council Ideas Grant. I and mean, it's not incredible, really, for an early career researcher like uh, Michelle. So it goes uh, without saying that we're incredibly proud of her achievements. Um, the title of her presentation this afternoon is Bioengineering for the Eye. Uh, please welcome Michelle. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Um, some of my research looking at how we can apply bioengineering techniques for structures in and around the eye. Bioengineering is a really exciting area of research because it has such widespread potential applications and impacts. Bioengineering aims to create um, alternate tissue constructs with a combination of biological and artificial material. It offers new ways to approach reconstruction, pathways for regeneration, and the holy grail of this potential organ replacement. It also offers researchers new opportunities to study disease pathways and ways to um, investigate new novel therapies. So it started for us several years ago with the eyelid, actually, because skin cancer is incredibly common in Australia and it affects the eyelid in 10% of cases. And unlike elsewhere, the tissue around the lid is sparse and delicate and the eyelid cartilage in particular is very difficult to substitute. So the eyelid cartilage was an ideal starting candidate for bioengineering because there was a clear need for it. It's a relatively simple structure and it's easily accessible. So we applied the basic principles of bioengineering to this tissue. And this is shown here in this diagram. You start with your target tissue and you have to really understand what this tissue does, how it functions, what it's made up of, because you then need to replicate 
the artificial or the skeleton of the tissue in the form of the, this artificial scaffold, which is really critical to the success of any bioengineering tissue construct. Onto that scaffold, you need to culture cells. So you need to be able to proliferate your target cell population and seed those cells onto the scaffold to create this new bioengineered tissue construct before finally being able to reimplant it. Now, at each step, it's really important to think about whether or not what you're doing is clinically translatable. Because, for instance, it would be terribly suboptimal if it took three years to culture enough cells, or if you needed, you know, the equivalent of 10 eyelids worth of tissue to be able to culture enough cells for your scaffold. So keeping in mind that kind of bench to bedside um, philosophy is really important. And we've, we've come a long way in terms of bioengineering eyelids. So we started with our target tissue, which was the cartilage of the eyelid, and we studied its biomechanics. And working with our colleagues at the University of Melbourne, we developed a, a novel, a 3D bioengineered scaffold, which is porous and has fine tunable properties. And we have constructed this with FDA approved material. Importantly, also, we've been able to culture the cells that we're interested in using just biopsy size samples of tissues. So this is millimeter size samples of tissues, which we take, you know, which can be taken in the clinic using just local anesthetic. And importantly, these cells grow very well on our scaffold that we've made. And also, very importantly, this scaffold is biocompatible. So you can see there the two rats side by side. One has had the artificial scaffold and one has had just a commercially available implant. And clinically and histologically, they are indistinguishable. So really, we're at this very exciting phase now here where we can translate this clinically and we're looking to start human trials potentially in the next year. So what about more complex tissue? So the lacrimal gland is, is a much more complex tissue because it's a gland and it secretes tears, which has huge implications for how we can study pathogenesis of dry eye and, and then applications of various treatments for dry eye, which is incredibly debilitating and can be blinding in some cases. Now, previous studies looking at lacrimal gland have required entire glands for cell culture. Now, remember that this is this is completely, you know, it's, it's not clinically translatable if you need to take out the whole gland in order to culture the gland. So we've applied our small sample cell culture techniques. And here you can see these cells starting to form using just millimeter sized samples of lacrimal gland. And these were taken at the time of various um, eyelid procedures. And taking this tissue has no implication on the, the structure and function of the remaining gland. Importantly, the tissue has secretory function. And you can see that, that the, the middle image of lysozyme is a particular enzyme that we look for in terms of tear secretions. And because we already have a scaffold that we know is biocompatible and has fine tunable properties, we're now looking at how we can culture these cells onto that scaffold to create the first bioengineered lacrimal gland. So now we've begun to tackle the most complex tissue of the eye, and that's the retina. And um, Bob's talk was great because it had a lot of anatomy of the retina. You recall that there are many different cell types. And previously, researchers have been able to study um, retinal cells by culturing retina from entire eyes. And these are taken post-mortem, so cadaver eyes, where you take the entire retina and then you can culture the different types of cells from that. But we wondered whether or not it would be possible to culture cells using, again, these biopsy sized samples of tissue. So in the, in the photograph on the top right, you can see these two tiny little pieces of translucent tissue. And that's actually micron sized pieces of retina taken at the time of, of various retinal procedures. And from these tiny micron sized pieces of retina, we've actually been able to successfully culture retinal cells. And that long um, kind of green cell that you can see in the bottom um, right is, that, is, is the rudimentary retinal ganglion cell. So this is really exciting um, work, obviously a long, long way to go, but offers huge potential in terms of how we can study blinding diseases. So in summary, we really try and maintain a clinically translatable approach to our research of, of how we can apply these techniques to structures in and around the eye. And this idea that we can create bespoke tissue replacement is becoming a reality. And we've demonstrated proof of concept with our eyelid cartilage. So now we're applying our techniques to increasingly more complex ophthalmic tissue. And this has you know, potentially vision restoring implications. 
As with any research, it wouldn't be possible without a team of people. So I'd like to particularly acknowledge Professor Selvern um, and Bob Casson, Dr. Chan, who work alongside myself at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Dr. John Wood is our chief scientist in the, in the lab who um, does a lot of our kind of cell culture work, and our master's student, Luke Halliday. And we have a long-standing collaboration with um, Associate Professor Andrea O'Connor, uh, from the University of Melbourne, and she has been working with us on all our scaffold work. And we've been fortunate to receive uh, funding for this work as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, Michelle, that's a terrific presentation, and um, it's really incredible that uh, it's such a complex tissue that you're able to start to actually um, deconvolute that complexity by culturing cells from, from, from the eye and eye structures. Um, I guess my question, having worked in this space, um, in terms of bioengineered products and the like, my, my questions always come to, um, you know, meeting the expectations of patients in regard to being able to replace tissues in a meaningful way. And like you say, you're starting with a biopsy-sized uh, piece of tissue and then cultivating it ex vivo um, with, with the use of biomaterials as a means to, to create structure. The question I have is, is, is what do you see this as being an, an autologous transplantation process uh, where you take a sample ex vivo, what's the timeline between sort of, what do you see as being from taking the sample right through to delivering a, you know, an engineered product to a patient? Yeah, so this was, um, this is a great question and really kind of practical and comes down to kind of how we approach our, our research in this area. So with eyelid cartilage, usually when you get diagnosed with an eyelid tumour, you have a biopsy taken at the time to get a tissue diagnosis. And that's an ideal opportunity. And you normally would take a little margin of normal tissue as well. So there's the opportunity to take a biopsy size sample of normal tissue. And then it would take some time for the, for the pathology lab to turn around that tissue to get a tissue diagnosis. And then, um, then you would get a date for surgery. And that's usually within kind of, it's a category two procedure. So usually within a few months, if it's the type of um, skin cancer that's, that's most common. So basal cell carcinoma, for instance. And so we have tried to replicate that timeline by then um, culturing those cells over several weeks and then culturing those cells onto the scaffold over several weeks. So we've kind of replicated that timeline such that by the time the patient comes for surgery in that three month window, we have a tissue construct that is ready for reconstruction. Probably a, a question which you considered deeply is, is obviously you're taking this from an, an, a margin, an area of, of tissue, which apparently looks normal when you're proposing to culture it ex vivo. Do you do cytogenic testing or assess that the, the the tissue that you do grow is not contaminated with any of those cancer cells that uh, that might might have got into the product. I mean, can you talk to me a bit about that? Yeah, so, I mean, we're really looking at culturing one particular type of cell type, which is the structural cell, the fibroblast. Yeah. Because the eyelid, um, the eyelid heals really well and we're only taking millimetre-sized samples of tissue. So really when you come down to clinical, the actual clinical translation, you could take a little bit of, bit of tissue either from the other lid or from yep. kind of an, an alternate site that's, that's not a, exactly adjacent to where sure. the tumour is. Um, so that's certainly very possible. And in terms of the biomaterials that you're actually using, I mean, can you tell me a little bit about the nature of the biomaterials that you're using? Obviously, you said they were FDA approved. And that obviously means that the, the time from, you know, development right through to actually delivery to a patient is, is shortened. But can you tell me a bit about the materials that you're using? Yeah, so we're working with, um, as I said, Andrea O'Connor at the um, University of Melbourne, and we've we initially looked at a few different um, biomaterials. We ended up using Cartizan. So Cartizan is FDA approved. It's actually already clinically in use in various bandages. It has kind of um, antimicrobial properties. So they're, they're already Cartizan embedded um, bandages and, and various, um, it's used quite extensively in tissue engineering. So the type of Cartizan that we use is a medical grade Cartizan um, made in Germany. And it's widely used in tissue engineering studies. We've kind of edited it, and, and Andrea knows a lot more of the details, um, but we've kind of edited it in terms of its, its porosity, its, its kind of um, its flexibility and its, its structure. And those are things that can be then fine-tuned if we then want to apply it to other types of tissue in and around the eye. Fantastic. I've got some uh, questions from the audience, which is wonderful. So from Paul Thomas, the uh, question is, are retinal cells post-mitotic? If so, do they need somehow to trick the cells into expanding in culture? 
That is a very interesting question. I'm actually not sure what the answer is for that. I'd have to ask John, John, our chief scientist. This is really, these photos came to me last week. We really are at the very kind of, this is, this is hot off the press kind of thing. Um, yeah, I can, I can certainly look into that and get back to so you. We'll, t we'll, we'll take that question on notice. And um, so thank, thanks for sure. But, and I also have a question from uh, Ben Kyle. Uh, and he's asked, is there a role for reprogramming as an alternative complement or complementary approach to this. Yeah, so, so that's, I think he's talking about IPS or something. Yeah, no, that, that's yeah. really interesting. Actually, the um, the group that I'm going to work with at Stanford is looking at how they can um, get stem cells to grow into retinal ganglion cells. Um, so that's, that's a whole other area of, um, of research, which is incredibly interesting as well. And certainly potentially complementary in how we can apply the different types of techniques. Um, so yeah, I mean, very much so. There, there, there may be a role and we, we should definitely look into that. We can chat further on that, perhaps. Fantastic. Thanks. Um, oh, look, when are you planning to leave? We've now that COVID, uh, I guess, the immunisation rates... We're leaving in, in a month. In, well, well, all I can do is, uh, is wish you well on, on behalf of the university colleagues and, uh, and uh, your hospital colleagues, but, but we hope that you have a really successful time over there. I want to, again, thank both of our speakers for this afternoon. It's been a really fascinating uh, journey into the eye. Um, and so the eyes have it. I thought I'd throw that one in for, for good measure. I'm just, I do apologise. It's my dad coming out at me and my jokes. Uh, before we close off, I just wanted to remind people that these uh, mini reviews are actually recorded and are available on the ABMC website. So if you uh, go to the ABMC website, uh, which is Adelaide, www.adelaidebiomedcityoneword.com, under the banner of webinars, uh, you can actually watch this webinar as well as previous past recordings. Um, so I welcome you to join us next week where there'll be two new speakers uh, presenting. Um, and I want again, thank you to the audience and thank you to our speakers for a fantastic presentations this afternoon. Um, and bye for now. Cheerio.